Visions are dangerous. Visions can really mess things up. And prophecy, oh, that's a whole deep can of worms that can cause all manner of issues and problems with you, with those around you, and with society in general. But we shouldn't get rid of them, right? Like, they have a place in our lives. What do we do with people that are very visionary and are having visions? What do we do if we're one of those people? Well... It's a very complicated topic. Let's talk about it as we walk together down Creations Fast. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie. I am a Christo pagan druid and priest of Bridget. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian. I am an inconsequential psychic. I see a pencil. It's sitting right over there. So... This is going to be one of those topics that people are either going to ignore, get really, really worked up about, or go, ah, I thought that my entire life. I, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of indifference to this. There are going to be people that just really don't want to listen, people that don't want to hear and just comment wildly. Or So please hear us out on this. This isn't just our opinions. All This has been a part of the tradition for a very long time but it's not something that gets a lot of discussion and i think it actually is the antidote to a lot of the spiritual psychosis issues especially that are going on over on the tiktoks right now and remember if it's the middle way not too serious not too silly yeah frivolous remember both you have to hold a both end in one's mind oh, on this, this is topic gonna, this because, is going to be a tricky one yeah so before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app you happen to be listening to us on. We do original Christo Pagan and Druid content on this channel five days a week, Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss a thing because we've got a lot of interesting topics. We even do viewer request episodes. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming along. And you don't want to miss a thing. Okay. I almost feel like we need to start with, okay, toolbox check. Open up your toolbox. Let's make sure you have these tools in your toolbox, right? Prove all things. Hold fast to that, which is true. Check. Check. Okay. You'll know them by their fruits. Check. Check. Don't take your, your magic and your spirituality too seriously. Check. Okay. Don't be too frivolous in your magic and spirituality. Check. Check. And even in community, your practice is still personal. It is still your practice. Thus... Translated through your own personal engine. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Okay. The first thing is I would be using a big word a lot during this episode. So let's talk about it. Let's start there. I'm going to be talking about numinous experiences. This is a very important word because I don't know of another word in the English language that I could actually sub it out for. There are a lot of words that I could use, as, but they aren't really synonyms. They're just in a similar kind of place. So a numinous experience is kind of a cousin to a liminal experience, which we just did an episode on not that long ago. A numinous experience is one that kind of hits you, knocks you dumb, like just completely dumbstruck, unable to talk, move, often in a state of wanting to flee, but unable to flee. Like it, they're generally terrifying in some way, shape or form, but that's have a character where they feel absolutely 100% real and worldview shattered. Not all numinous experiences are quite that grand, but many fall into that category. They are, if you are doing angel practices, often the first time you experience an angel is a numinous experience. It kind of rocks you to your core. You do the calls and Oh, hi, that th Michael's over there. Hi. And it just kind of hits. Some people have these spontaneously during meditation. It's actually not uncommon to have a spontaneous ex and luminous experience during meditation to the point where St. Gregory Palamas wrote an entire book going, no, they're not demon possessed. They're just meditating. When he was dealing with a group in, I think, the 1300s that were basically practicing a Christian form of mindfulness meditation and he kept seeing themselves surrounded by this bright light a whole theology developed around that but that's not what we're here for today 
Numinous experiences generally shake you to your core. They are distinguished from other kind of visionary experiences by the fact that they are in some way profound. They hit you differently. I have had a few in my life and they are uh, hard to explain. This is a thing. <laughs> They're a thing. Yeah. The, it's a qua, the what's it. I, I love that word for that, that phrase for that, because it really is. It's a what's it. it. It is what it is. It's like having someone speak to you, but you're not hearing or experiencing that spoken to-ness on the regular level that most of your interactions are on. It's like they're speaking to your core instead. The the first truly numinous experience I can think of that I'm able to kind of put into words I had when I was still a Catholic at the time. I was attending a service as part of the charismatic renewal that was happening in the Catholic Church. The priest came over and put his hand on my head and prayed that the Holy Spirit would enter us. The last thing he said is, with fire. It was like the entire world shattered. I was just surrounded by holy flame. It was one of the most profound experiences of my life, like worthy of an anime or something. Like it just, my entire world changed. I had a full visionary experience. It was profound and then spent months with my spiritual director trying to work through well, what happened in understanding it. Like it was literally a very short moment in time that took months to unravel and kind of figure out what it was. That is very common with numinous experiences. I will say that they are real. They do happen, but they really are not as special as people make them out to be. That's really what we're trying to get at here. One, if you meditate for any period of time, you have the chance of experiencing certain brands of this. You may experience ego death. You may experience complete meditative absorption, which I would put into this category of numinous experience. I've had that happen to me as well, and it was terrifying. I mean, utterly terrifying. The sensation of just ceasing to exist as a separate being. I don't know how long I was in that state based on the time of day when my meditation was over. It actually wasn't for very long, but it felt like an eternity. And I've had visionary experiences like the one I just talked about. Now, the problem that people have is they start taking these wrong. They start making themselves a hero and a monomyth, and they suddenly go, I am the chosen one. I love you all dearly. None of us are the chosen one. And all of us are the chosen one, but none of us are that special. You can see back to earlier episodes. God is in all of us. None of us are God. Right. None of us is the next Messiah. All of us are part of the body of Christ. None of us is the next savior of the world. All of us are a part of the savior of the world. I, I hate to break anybody's ego. If you need the ego hammer to hit you, though, you need the ego hammer to hit you. We're not that special. None of us is that special. I would say even the great heroes of our traditions aren't really all that special. The movements that they started were special, not them. And we focus sometimes way too much on the one individual and miss the key. Several friends of mine, and I talk about this a lot, like so much focus is on Moses that they forget that Miriam and Aaron did most of the actual work. Like Moses is really a figurehead kind of spokesman character. A lot of excuses not to do it. I'm not knocking the guy because he still did it, but he really didn't want to. The focus has really been for so long on this great man view of history that yeah, it took a village. Like it took a village to keep a Moses alive and it took a village to accomplish everything that Moses was trying to get them to, to do, that God was trying to get them to do, right? We forget that and we overlook that because it makes a better story to say this one person. It all came down to this one person, this make or break moment with this one person. And this is going to sound blasphemous to a lot of Christians, but I think we do this also with Jesus. Like Jesus was very important. Don't get me wrong. I have a very strong love and devotion to Jesus. I believe that he was the son of God, uh, and, uh, all that. But if the message had died with him, if everybody had gone home after the crucifixion, right? If Mary, 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 and Mary hadn't got to the two, right? Not repeating. There is that many Marys. Oh, it's like six or seven of them. <laughs> hadn't gone to the tomb, if they hadn't been the first to have the experience of the risen Christ, we know the apostles had given up. They'd given up. Yeah. Right. Who are the heroes in the story? You know what I'm saying? Like 
who it, it's it's this group of Marys. Oops, fart. I think Martha was actually included in the list of from those who went. So. so a bunch of Marys and a Martha um, were included in the list. But we forget about a lot of these figures, again, because of great man history. We forget about, you know, Suzanne and Joanna, who are very important figures in the New Testament, in the Gospels, as followers of Jesus. Because, again, we only remember the names of like two or three of the men. It was the movement that mattered. Now, I say all of this not to, like, denigrate your faith in Christ or to or Moses or any of these figures, but the vision wasn't important. And I need to stress that again. The vision wasn't important. We can learn things from these visions, right? The vision that Moses had at the burning bush where God reveals the name, you know, I am what I am. I become what I will become, however you want to translate the Hebrew there, um, is important. And we can learn a lot from that. But it was the work that he, Aaron, and Miriam did that got the people out. That, that, that's the important part of the story. The visions are just a footnote, really. Like, if you actually look at the story, the visions are punctuation markers. They're points. And when we have this great man view of history and think, oh, he saw God in the burning bush and he went up on the mountain and he met with God. And yeah, that worked really well, didn't he? He came down and they were worshiping an idol and he destroyed the Ten Commandments and had them kill each other for a bit. Like, read the story. It's messed up. And I had to go back up the mountain and go, please, can I have those again? Because I kind of destroyed the ones that you gave me. Yet the vision is a punctuation point in the story. To that, you even have later stories where you have prophets full of visions warning the kings not to do this and not to do that. The visions didn't solve everything. The kings chose not to in bad Stuff, stuff happened. It happens oh. over and over again. Even in the context of the story of Moses, Moses is like, I have this prophecy, this vision, and Pharaoh's like, that's nice. And bad stuff happened. And we see this like Samuel constantly like, Samuel. no, no, no. God said kings are bad. And you know, most right statement in the Bible, kings are bad. Kings are bad. Most correct statement in the, in the Bible, truth proven throughout history. Kings are thousands bad. Thousands of thousands of years later, we're still trying to get it through our head. Kings are bad. Kings are bad. And nobody listens. But we put this importance on this experience. The Apostle Paul goes so far as to say, of all the spiritual gifts, pray that you pr can prophesy. Like, this is the one that he wanted everyone to have. And there is utility in it. Now, he had a very nuanced view of prophecy. And if you want, we can talk about Pauline prophecy in a future episode. Let me know in the chat if you want us to do that. Because his view of prophecy was more about the word of faith or the word of wisdom. It wasn't the grand sweeping, like John seeing the apocalypse kind of prophecy. The very different view of prophecy. We should probably do an episode on that later. And also along with that, though, he also emphasized the importance on somebody also having the gift of interpreting that prophecy. Yeah. Because that's the thing we're always talking about. It's, it, there's this translation engine and trying to understand the actual message behind and to weed out the, the extra stuff that so, comes in. So when I say that visions are dangerous, that prophecy is dangerous, one, most of them are just for... Okay. For the individual? No, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> the apostles are very clear about this, and I think that they were right. No prophecy is for personal interpretation. And I agree with that because this is the problem in all of this is it overly personalized. So you have a vision of something, right? Let's go to Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel, one of the most famous visions in all of scripture, sees God and all of these various angels and all of these things happening. One of those powerful visions, like spun out to most of the magic and, and mysticism that follows, right? What was the importance of that vision? That vision? All of those grand things, the four living creatures, the throne of God fly, flying around here and there, the seraphim, the cherubim, like all of this grand vision. Well, that story starts with him being carted away in exile as a prisoner of a foreign empire. Not, not even a refugee, a slave, being carted off into captivity. He has this grand vision. Its only purpose is to say, don't worry. You had this idea that God only existed in that temple in Jerusalem. God's not bound to a physical place. God is everywhere. God is always moving. You're not alone. That's all it is. 
It's one of the grandest visions in the entirety of scripture. Like uh, he'd probably fill an entire library building with just books that have been written, trying to interpret this one vision that are still pulling out new insights out of this one vision. All it was, you're not alone. He stopped by, by a river to rest as he was being carted off. His heart was heavy because everything had been taken away. He was a priest and the temple had been destroyed. He and the rest of the people that he knew were being carted off to captivity. He didn't know what was going to happen when they got there. He felt alone. He felt desolate. His grand vision that literally launched a thousand magical and mystical traditions. Just, you're not alone, Ezekiel. It's fine. Don't worry. That, that is the message of the vision. You're not alone. Don't worry. How many people really get that when they read it? Because you get lost in all the details, right? Well, why are there these living creatures that have four faces of a lion and a man and a bull and an eagle? What is that all about? And what's the wheels with all the eyes on them? And what's this? And what's that? And what's the other thing? We get lost in all the details. This entire amazing vision was just a realization, a moment of stunning realization. We're not alone. Our God was not contained in a building. Our God did not die when the building was burned down. God is more than that. This is the beginning of the movement to this strict cosmic monotheism that, Jew, that the Israelite religion and later Judaism would evolve into. It's just a vision saying everything's okay. Don't worry. You're not alone. And Ezekiel gets that. He's one of the few prophets in scripture who gets what his vision was. He, he so gets like, we're going to be okay that he's like, do I really have to do stuff? Like the rest of the book, he's still having grand and glorious visions. And, but do I, do I really have to do anything about it? Wait, we'll be fine. Right? Like he told me at the very beginning of this, he told me everything was going to be fine. I have to get fine. Like he was told, don't worry, be happy. And like lives the rest of the book trying to don't worry, be happy, but oh, he's got other things that he's got to do. This is why visions are dangerous. They're extremely easy to misinterpret. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting mystical and magical tidbits we can pull out of this vision, for example. But look at all the harm that's happened from the book of Revelation or Apocalypse, depending on the book that you're looking at. The Apocalypse of John, he's writing to a Christian church under the persecution of Nero. And the whole point of the book is, it's all right, we're going to get through this. But he can't call people by name, so he uses... A number of them, there's a guy in a town built on seven hills whose name, when you add it up, is either 616 or 666. Yeah, that's that's Caesar Nero. And but just in case you don't get it, he describes what Nero's doing. Like, we're all together, right? You know who I'm talking about here? Okay. Okay. I can't say it, but you get it, right? But we're not living under Nero anymore. Not long after Nero died... The misinterpretation started to the point where many of the early church fathers were like, we don't need this book anymore. It's already happened. It's not future tense. It's past tense. They got through to the other side. From their point of view, the kingdom of God had happened. They, they were now living in a Christian kingdom, which is what the book is about. The old order was swept away and Constantine was bringing in the new order. Like everything done and dusted, clap the hands, let's move on. And many people didn't think it even belonged in scripture because it was done. We have people today, preachers today, talking about when it will happen. Are there mystical insights you can glean from this book? Yeah. But it's all a strict misinterpretation, which, by the way, is forbidden by the book itself. The book itself very clearly says at the end, anybody who tries to interpret this book is going to hell. It's a little curse in it. Yeah. It's the only book in the Bible that has a curse contained in the book. If you add anything to this, to this book, all of the plagues in this book will be added unto you. And if you take anything away from this book, your name shall be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. Like it has a curse in the book telling you, don't think about it too much. Because there's no way to talk about the contents of that book without adding something to it or taking something away. There's absolutely no way to do it. It's just there to read, to comfort yourself while going through persecution. That's what the book is about. Not to have deep and profound thoughts on, which is why you, you never hear me talking yeah. out of the book this, of Revelation. This is why out of the 100 and, I don't know, if we're, somewhere between 65 and 70 episodes, this is probably the first time we've talked about it. Maybe the second. We don't talk about it. Because of very reason. And I'm using these very famous prophecies because when we have these numinous moments, we want to put ourselves in the category of these great prophets. It tends to feed our ego and that's always bad. Most prophecy in the sense of what Paul was talking about of prophecy 
is kind of private. It's little bits of wisdom, the little insights. He, Paul was really talking about having the gift of uh, intuition. If he were around today, the phrase he would probably use there would be that you would have the gifts of a good intuition, but th that word didn't exist in the way that it does now. So he says prophecy. And again, he's talking about words of wisdom and words of knowledge, which again, are those intuitions, those little insights that just kind of pop into your mind. Prophecies are dangerous because they tend to feed our ego. They tend to make us cast a story around ourselves that isn't true and isn't helpful. Now, I could have, when I had the experience in that charismatic movement, I am the chosen one. I mean, I kind of couldn't because it was in the Catholic context. And anytime you gave any signs of having a spiritual experience, you immediately were assigned a spiritual director to help you work through it. Because, yeah, that's a good thing to do. Not a lot of positive things I can say about the Catholic Church, but yeah, you got that one right. Good on you. You get a check mark and a gold star on one thing. Oh. But that was a moment of me just teetering in my faith at the time. And it was the whole point of this grand vision experience I had was the power of community, that we are always stronger together than we are alone. And stop cutting myself off from connections with other people. The vision, any little meaning that I'm supposed to take out of it. And that's usually what most numinous experiences are. Now, I think what you were trying to get at when you were like, they're personal. Most visions are to be shared. That's different from personal. That's why I wanted to jump yeah. in because yeah, no, people I, might misunderstand that. Yeah. And that's why I appreciate the clarification there. It can easily be misunderstood. Because most visions that we have are honestly something that simple. Yes, you are interconnected with the rest of the world. Yay. There might be a different message. But what we have to understand is anytime we have a spiritual experience and we receive any kind of revelation from the small to the large, that is a burden, not a blessing, because none of us have the right to impose our spiritual views and beliefs on others. Not a single one of us. I've had some profound experiences. There's a reason I call myself a priest of Bridget. I have had profound experiences with her and with one exception, really the episode we did, The Forge of Souls, I have not talked about any of them because it's not for me to share most of those. And it's definitely not my place to go to other people that are Bridget, Bridget practitioners and go, hey, I Bridget said this. Because if they're practicing with her, she'll tell them. That's not my place. And that's where a lot of people get mis a misunderstanding about this. The prophets that we're talking about in especially the Hebrew scriptures, most of them were trained we forget that there was a school of prophecy. There was a school of the prophets. Elijah ran it, and then Elisha ran it after he went away. And like we have names of people, and they literally traveled around in groups together. It was a form of mystical, magical practice. Whether Isaiah or Ezekiel or any of the other prophets on record were part of that school or not, we don't know. Because again, prophecy can happen spontaneously. But they were part of a tradition that understood the limitations on prophecy. In fact, the Torah makes it very clear. If a prophet predicts an event that does not happen, kill them. Because prophecy is not about predicting the future. None of the prophets predict the future. They always are talking about what's happening right then and now in front of them. I guess this is where we can take a moment to talk about visions of the future. They do happen. I have experienced them quite a few times, but it gets very weird and strange. I like to test things and prove things and hold on to that, which is true because I've had them frequently enough in my life. I have also been able to actually test them. And I can tell you from personal experience, A, things can change. Yes. You can do things to change the visions. Yes. One of the stories I like to share when I talk about this is I had a vision of a heated argument that I was going to get into that was going to ruin a relationship with someone in my past. And it was going to set up a path of a lot of struggle in my future. And I actually was able to take the steps to fix what needed to be fixed and heal things so that that argument never happened. It built up again. It was building, the tension was building, but it was able to diffuse and it changed. Therefore, in and of itself, even those visions are not guaranteed events to actually happen. And that is one of the biggest problems with the visions and why they're really for personal self and they are a burden. Yeah. 
it's a burden to know those things. I, I again, I don't think they're for personal stuff. They're always for the community. For, for, yeah, they're for the community. They're always for the community, but they're not always to be shared with the community. Yeah. If I had told that person that we were going to have this big argument, it would have added fuel to the fire that was trying to build, to the potential negative energy that was building to that future event. I know it bugs some people when I quote the scripture that is Star Wars, but there, there are some nuggets of wisdom in there. And on this topic, Yoda has it right. Yeah. Mostly emotion the future is. That's the thing. When we are having those experiences, it is almost impossible even with practice, to weed out what are your fears, just projecting visually in front of you. Because again, see all of our previous episodes on dealing with magical creatures and, and active imagination. It is impossible in the moment to really know, and I mean know, that you're not having an imaginary experience, that you're not just projecting, that your emotions have gotten so heightened and so strong that you're in meditation and they just, the dam bursts and they just flood out in this imagery in front of you. I think there is a feeling that you can kind of discern of when something's coming from inside and outside. But again, that's it's art of, at best. Yeah, a lot of practice and an art at best. And still, I don't think you will ever really be sure which it is until after we pass on. A lot of visions of the future are just your mind having a kind of a psychic panic attack. And projecting, even if you're having a valid vision, right? An external spirit of some sort is giving you a vision that deals with the future because it is always filtered through your imagination. I can't stress that enough. Your fears, your preconceptions, and your current understanding of the world are going to change it, filter it, and cause you to have misunderstandings about what you are seeing and experiencing. Another way to understand this particular aspect of it is to think of it from a psychological perspective. So you're facing something in your life. So you have a conversation with a friend. You will experience and understand the conversation with the friend one way when you're operating in, we'll call it your normal state of mind. Now take that same conversation and add, say there's a whole bunch of drama and excitement worry, dread, fear, and all these heightened emotions and have that same conversation, you're going to wildly misinterpret. You're going to wildly experience that conversation so differently. And this is on what would be considered a mundane interaction. There are a lot of fun videos out there that show how little circumstances can change the way you perceive things that will show you the same scene from a TV show or a movie, but they'll change the music soundtrack or maybe the lighting cues. Like they'll put a filter on it so the lighting is different same words same exact scene but you perceive it so much differently because of these other little things that are getting in the way and filtering that information before it gets to you so as with all things our our vision is dangerous yes yeah saint john of the cross very clearly gave the advice that you should just ignore them and pretend that they didn't happen and i don't know that i would go as far as john does <laughs> on that but it's not bad advice because nothing, it should not be feeding your ego. If you have an experience that feeds your ego, that is problematic because we're trying to fill the correct amount of space, not inflate ourselves into thinking that we're very important. And I have to say for anybody who's like, but we are really, really important. Go outside on a cloudless night in a place that's very dark and look at the skies. I'm sorry for bringing up the insignificance that it causes existential dread in a lot of people, but we are tiny specks in this cosmos. None of us are that important. And a lot of visionary experiences trick people into thinking that they are the center of the universe. And the answer to that is everyone is at the center of the universe and no one is at the center of the universe. Because the fun thing about inflation and how the universe is expanding is no matter where you're standing, you are in the center of the universe at that moment in time. It's in, it's it's weird. It's wacky. It's an interesting like physics thing if you want to dig into it. But yes, they they are dangerous and don't seek them out. Again, Jesus said it's a wicked and corrupt generation that seeks after visions because again they're not they're not what you think they are. I, I would much rather have 
the experience of making a healing tea that works than have a luminous vision. And I say this for like 30 years of practice. Well, along with it, the future is what you make of it. The visions do not determine the future. The actions of the individuals will determine the future. And the vast majority of visions are not about the future and are misinterpreted to be about it. They're 99% of the time about what's happening right now and not the future. But we have turned prophecy into this thing about the future. That's augury. That's a completely different thing. Yeah. Augury and divination. We've done episodes on that as well. And they're equally as unreliable because there is equally misinterpreted. Still helpful. And it can be changed. And it can be changed. <laughs> yeah. So you and others. I, I hope that this is helpful. I really want to do this episode because with everything that has happened in the country lately, I have seen a lot of so-called prophets saying, look, I have proven that I am called of God because X, Y, and Z happened. And, oh, that's not how any of that works. Like, look, I, I am a Christo pagan for a reason, and you may have issues with the church and I do too, but Jesus said a lot of true things. And the most true of them is you will know them by their fruits. If they're leaving behind death, destruction, discord, and mayhem, they are not from God. And, uh, you look at a lot of the people that are claiming to be prophets and yeah, I see a lot of discord and mayhem, hatred, violence, all signs that, you know, you're, you're not really a prophet. Yeah. So hopefully that helps you out. If it did, please let us know. What, what are your thoughts about prophecy? I don't want to get into like deep arguments or discussions about specific prophets of either the Hebrew scriptures of the New Testament or any of the mystics throughout the, time. The caveat with that, if there, if you want some future episodes debating or discussing that, it's a conversation we can have on the side. You I, know, do, do let us know. Yeah. You know, we, we, we can start the conversation on the side there and then build it into a future episode. But if you've never had a numinous experience, and they're not all they're cracked up to be, they really aren't. And honestly... If you want something that's even better, go find somebody that you are really close to and give them a hug. I'm sorry. I had to sit back and go, no, you're living a blessed life. Yeah. That's what the priest is for. Yeah. You're living a, truly a blessed life. Uh, but honestly, I would rather have a hug from somebody that I'm close to than any of these kinds of grander experiences. The the hug is far more meaningful in most cases. Like for those that have a uh, know-it-all in their life that likes to show up and go, well, actually... I mean, that's really what how those experiences basically are. You have a cosmic know-it-all that shows up and goes, well, actually. And off the cross. Yeah, you need you the, the correction. Kind of you just got to figure out what the corrections do. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Let us know. Do you have a favorite prophet? Prophecy. What are your feelings about prophecy? Let us know in the comments. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, but even if they say you can leave a comment, they won't let us know. So you leave one there because engagement is magic. But head on over to creationspasts.com and click on chat and you can leave them a comment there and we will see it and be able to respond. While you're there, if you have a few dollars, you can pass our way. Don't forget to If you have a few dollars, you can pass our way and maybe think about joining a membership there or you can support us on Patreon or Ko-fi IMC or sit on both. Thank you so much to everybody who does that. And if you don't have any money, don't worry about it. You can always help us out by letting other people know that we exist and that we are doing this work and I have to say, if you have somebody who's currently had a numinous experience, this may not be the best episode to give them because if they're up in their feelings and in their ego, yeah, they're just going to ignore everything that we said, but you know, so you can try to help them through that experience because it really is one of those things. You need a support group because you're going to wildly misinterpret what happened to you if you have one of these experiences. Like it's <laughs> not, not a good thing. It's like how, you know, surviving a bear attack makes you love life more. Yeah. Nobody needs to go have a bear attack so that they can feel more connected to being alive. All righty. Thank you all for listening. And as we're going out, we like to say a little prayer. And today, I think it would be more than fitting to say a prayer to the Archangel Raziel, the Archangel of Mysteries and Puzzles. Oh, blessed Raziel, who delivers us all the wonderful gifts of mystery and helps us to walk through the great cloud of unknowing and accept the things that we cannot understand as the great and profound mysteries that they are. 
Help us all throughout this life as we experience various forms of spiritual awakening to walk through them with humility and grace so that we may come out the other side better and more able to perfect and heal and repair this world. Amen. Amen. 